Good afternoon. Um, welcome to Debugging Tricks with Apache HTTP Server 2.4. Uh, this presentation is going to be done by Jeff Trawick with uh, EmptyHammock.com. That's his company. And without further ado, take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Let me put this a little closer. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, let me know if you're having a problem and you care. Um, so I'm going to talk about debugging tricks. Uh, I'm going to try to cover all the stuff that's new with 2.4, you know, tracing or, or anything else. Um, but I also give some general coverage, both of existing HTTPD features as well as um, some things that you could use with any kind of program. Okay, um, yeah, I've worked, uh, worked on Apache web server a long time, about 14 years. And a lot of that time I spent at um, IBM and Oracle and Sun and supported customers of, you know, WebSphere or WebLogic server, whatever, that used an Apache-based server as their front end. So, so I have been, um, been through a lot of uh, debugging sessions, uh, but was smart enough to get out of that. So... Maybe I'll be lucky. Um, so, you know, here's just kind of issues, right? Web server issues or server issues. Um, child process crashes or the server seems to be hanging or certain requests are stalled, et cetera. Or the thing stops when you didn't want it to stop. Um, bad response time, you know, and so on. Down, down to... Um, I'm not getting the right thing back from this particular request, even though, in general, things seem to be operating okay. Right? All sorts of uh, bad things. Also, um, things that aren't problems where you might want to use debugging tools. If you have a new, you know, even upgraded the software or you've made interesting changes in configuration, you know, you might want to use some of the, at the very least, use some of the logging, increase log levels, look at things you don't usually look at just to see if they're complaining about things that you think should be okay. Or, um, you know, understanding steady state behavior is very important because uh, let's say that you have a, you're trying to research a problem symptom and you say, oh, this, this thing is logging. I'm getting this error log message all, very frequently. Well, does that have anything to do with the problem? I don't know. Maybe you were getting it all the time. Right, so it's useful to, even when everything's working well, um, look, look at the logs and maybe increase the log levels just so you understand what it should look like. And we'll talk about different tools that look, you know, right inside the web server, um, you know, logging and, and other things. I do want to, I mean, I think probably everybody already knows this, but, you know, when you, when you start increasing log levels, uh, when some vendor says, hey, I need you to log this field with your access log record so we can tie that to every request or something. You know, that you may be logging things that are private information. You know, somebody's um, base64 encoded password or session keys or something. Uh, as soon as somebody tells you to increase the level of logging, you need to be sensitive to the fact that your logs may now have to be treated specially. Uh, certainly, you want to back down your log level, or you don't want to certainly back out whatever change you made when it's no longer needed for debugging. But also, um, there may be private private stuff in those log files. So um, that's my um, whatever. My I'm I'm now immune. I'm immune from any bad advice I give you later on, because generally the the web server features that log things don't give you ways to hide certain things. You know, you think it'd be pretty simple. That, well, if I'm going to log the authorization header, maybe I should just zap out certain, you know, the value. Or if, if I'm going to log a password or something, maybe I should just put asterisks there and don't put the same number of asterisks as, the, as, the, as there are characters in the password. Whoops. Okay, error log records in, in 2.4. Um, it's configurable for the first time. Um, you can decide what's in there. You can remove fields from every record. Um, Third-party modules can actually implement their own fields. Uh, and they're, 
usually the format is usually defined so that if information isn't available for a certain field, that field gets dropped. You know, like in this case, um, as with a lot of messages, it happens in request context. So we have the client IP and port number there. Well, if you know, the, you know the, that that um, field will be dropped if there's no client connection. You know, if it's a startup message or some general server operation thing. But the same can be done with um, with any of the fields. And that's interesting if you have a third-party module that implements fields. I just wanted to um, first get a level set. I should have done this already. How many people are actively using 2.4 now? Um, is everybody else using 2.2? Okay, that's cool. Okay. Um, so, uh, hiding, hiding error log fields, you can certainly take them out of the error log format um, in the .conf file, but uh, this is just a game I played. Uh, you know, sometimes I want to grep things out of the error log and hide some of the things, so like I have a little, you know, a little filter called no timestamp and that gets rid of that field. And maybe I want to get rid of the um, process, like in that, um, in most of these you see no pid tid.pl as part of the pipeline, right? So that gets rid of, rid of that field. And oh, I don't want the module name and the log level. And what's this last one? Um, I guess we finally get rid of the client too. So, you know, there are different ways to post-process the error log. Um, I worked for, worked on Oracle HTTP server for a while, which is an Apache-based server. And even the 2.2-based server has a, has a well-defined format for the error log by default. It's called Oracle Diagnostic Logging. And a lot of the pieces of the Oracle middleware use that same format. So when you pull these logs up to the, um, I guess it's called Fusion Middleware Control, you can actually select which fields you want to see. But you know, you can write very simple uh, filters that, that yank things out. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, you know, raise your hand and it'll mean we'll skip three slides later, but that's okay. Um, so in, in 2.4, we, well, let's say in 2.2, in the log level is defined, can only be defined on a um, virtual host level. Right, you can have different log level for different virtual hosts, but there's nothing that implements any kind of more fine-grained um, definition. Now in 2.4, the log level actually is stored in the, um, I guess stored in the request record. Right, somebody nod. Well, is it the request record or the, I'm sure it's the request record, yeah. So even though you can't, you can't put something in that log level in the request, by the, you know, just explicit configuration, uh, you can use modules that um, know how to do that. So, let's see, in this case, we're saying our, let's, this could be inside a virtual, uh, virtual host or just global, right? In general, we have an info log level, uh, relatively noisy, but certainly not debug. And uh, if the request comes from one of the loopback addresses on the web server box, hey, I'm gonna turn it all on for all modules, right? So it's so really noisy for loopback. Uh, everybody else gets um, something a lot less noisy. So that's, that's kind of cool, right? You could have, and this doesn't have to be loopback, right? This could be your special, special box you use for, for testing things. And you can be using the exact same setup as your you know, test or production environment and just by going from a certain box, you've got a lot of good debugging information. So that's, that's pretty cute. Um, another case is where uh, maybe in general your, your configuration is working good. You've, you're deploying a new application, probably not called that. And it's just not, there's some intermittent problems, right? Uh, we're going to have to crank up the log level there until we get this all sorted out. And again, Either of these cases lets you leave the working part of the configuration, you know, alone and just crank up the log level for very specific um, circumstances. Uh, we also have 
HTTP layer logging that's new. And we kind of see uh, what level this occurs at. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it yet, but that's the module. That's, a, that's an identifier for the module that implements this log message, and that's the trace level at which it, it traces. And uh, you may not have noted or had a reason to notice, but even the internal implementation of a lot of the web server uses the module APIs. And there is a module called mod HTTP. And if you do, you know, HTTPD-L to list the built-in built -in modules, you'll see it even in 2.2, right? So that's our, that's our module name. And core is another um, built-in module. Um, so you see, well, if, uh, if I'm tracing the HTTP module at level trace four or noisier, you know, up through trace eight, right, I can see the um, input uh, request headers. And let's see, what's this? Um, response sent with status 304. Um, I'm not really interesting since you have the access log, but that'll be traced uh, at trace three or, or noisier and you know, a little bit different level for some of these other things like the response headers. Not sure why these are different. Um, also, it's a little odd that you know, we're getting response stuff from the HTTP module, but it's the core module that's um, printing the analogous, logging the analogous information on input. And th you know, this is all new logging and controllable by either setting a global error log record to include that or, I'm sorry, er, global error log level or setting a module specific level. Okay, uh, mod log debug. This is a new module with 2.4 and uh, there are different ways to think about it. Um, you can actually, you basically configure certain log messages and you indicate under what circumstances you want that to be written. And uh, one, one cute thing that we'll see an example of is, is uh, say I want to log a certain value of the request associated with a request, you could log that at every um, API hook. You know, every time there's another hook, you could log the value of that. And um, it'll use, you know, conditional expression support in 2.4. Uh, to decide, you can use that to decide when to trace, when to write that message out. And uh, this is worth, I'm, I'm sure Jim and um, Rich already talked about this a little bit, but uh, there are more and more parts of the web server configuration that can exploit these same expressions. So it's worth looking at that and, um, you know, here's an example of that using the expression language, right? So let's just say that there was some request note. Sometimes modules uh, use notes so that different modules can look at their data, you know, things about their request, right? So that's a way to uh, log this particular note. We're going to log it at every hook, and we're going to start logging it when it has an unempty value. When it's, once it's defined, we're going to log it at every hook. Um, what's this one here? Here, the condition where we log something is if we have a sub-request. So, hey, when we have a sub-request that goes to that location, I don't know, maybe this could be a, um, maybe auto-index or something that's doing, that's doing auto-indexes, I'm sorry, that's doing sub-requests for the things in the index. When it gets to the type checker hook, we'll say, hey, we got a sub-request there. Not sure why you'd want to do that, but uh, sometimes you, you find out ways to use things once you are in a certain, um, once you're in a bad spot, usually. So, what is this? Maybe we want to put something in the error log every time we got this uh, 408, the timeout error. Maybe, you know, maybe that puts it, you know, there might be a 408 in the access log too, but maybe this puts it in the context with other error log messages. You know, it's probably going to occur on the same thread as some debugging messages um, for that request. Yes, sir? What's the latest That's an excellent question. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I know it goes through the handler, but what else is there? Log transaction? Well, I don't think it implements filters. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And um, I think one of these earlier slides even, there was a limitation here at one point that um, Stefan Frisch fixed. So complain to Stefan, maybe, uh, maybe it'll go away. That's, that's what I did. Okay, where are we? Mod dump IO. Does everybody know what mod dump IO is? It's worth looking at if you don't know what it is. Um, it can be useful for seeing the raw data inside the web server. Um, and I mean, I've, I've ellip ellipsified most of the stuff, right? But uh, it, it logs it above the layer of encryption, right? So, you know, packet traces are nice, but if nobody lets you have the keys or is willing to extract the data from a packet trace and it's over SSL, you're not going to do much with the application layer information. The part that's, there's a part that's different with, um, with 2.4, right? Uh, in 2.2 and before, you would have to tell uh, mod dump IO at which log level you want it to dump, and you kind of coordinate that with your log level that you chose based on everything else. No, yeah, and uh, in 2.4, it always traces at level trace 7, but since you can have a module-specific log level, you can just turn on that and you can set everything else to what you want. Let's see, what else? Catching requests that do not finish. Has anybody ever used mod log forensic? Okay, so the classical reason you would do this is maybe you have child process crashes and you want to know which, um, which request might have triggered that crash. So mod log forensic logs something at the beginning of the request and at the end of the request. And if you see that in the log and you don't, in its log file and you don't see that one, you know pretty much that it was active at the time of the crash. So maybe that's the trigger. Of course, maybe there were 50 active requests in that process. Who knows? Um, I guess theoretically it could be used uh, to see what might be hanging. You're not, you're not getting crashes, but you are getting certain requests that take forever. I guess you could, you could tell it that way, but mod status is the preferable way to, to tell that. And, and you don't have to actually eyeball everything. You can use, there's a script, check forensic that will scan the log file for things with this, you know, like the unique ID with a plus, and without the minus to say it's done. And by the way, all this stuff out here, it has the, um, the, all the request header fields, right? So, so you get some pretty good information on, on the request when you find out that it started but never finished. Okay. Um, tell them where the error message came from. I mean, you've already seen the, the examples I've been showing, right? They have a module ID and the log level, right? That's usually what you can tell. That's module core. That's the built-in, some of the built-in functionality in the server. Um, here's a case from a third-party module that doesn't have that information, right? So, I mean, I, we know it's mod WSGI because it says it is. Um, but it just hasn't been updated for 2.4 yet. Now here's a case that doesn't have mod WSGI, but I mean, I just happen to know it's logging the standard error from the Python script. Um, now you're supposed to be able to say, well, I saw this message in the error log and it, it's got module core, module info. If I don't want to see that or I, uh, I want to change my log level, but I want to make sure I keep seeing that message, then you know what the log level has to be for that module. Now, when the module ID isn't available, and this should be a, 
a dwindling number of third-party modules for 2.4 that just haven't had the line of code added yet. When you don't see that, then you can't use a module-specific log level to control that message. Right, you'll have to use your kind of global global log, or your default log level. I hate to say global because we think of that as not virtual host specific. I mean the, the default log level for all modules. Now here's, um, I have to show off all my little toys too, right? So I have this module I wrote called Mod Backtrace. And the version, the kind of new generation version um, implements, when you use it with 2.4, it implements an error log format, you know, capital B for backtrace. And you can give it a parameter, capital B, a parameter like this that says, hey, if um, that string is in the message, then build me a little bitty backtrace and stick that in the error log format. So, you know, this is like file not found, I think. or It's something very mundane, uh, probably not one you would use with this, but um, here was a message that, that had that magic string in it and the percent B turns into a little backtrace for that. Now, you know, probably the case where you're gonna use this is if you have some common, like a utility function in HTTPD that's logging something, and you have no idea how you got there, right? It's not, it's not mainline logic for some module, it's just some utility routine that maybe many modules call, right? So something like, you know, having a backtrace or having caller information can let you back, back out of that and see how you got there. Um, stuff we look at from the outside of the server, you know, resource, resource use, or we try to trace certain kinds of activity, you know, often um, trace syscalls. You know, here's some of the tools. I'm not, I'm not gonna go over these, but, you know, looking at, at resource use, or, you know, S hopefully everybody's used S trace trust or D trust, or are talking to their manager every day about moving off of Windows. Because if one of those conditions is not true, there's, you know, you need to spend some time and go, go play with those. Um, now, there are a lot of higher level tools now. Um, in particular, I want to talk about a couple of them. One of them is, is D trace, and, and this is actually a set of tools built on D trace. Uh, if you're on Solaris, these work really well. And, um, you know, by higher level tools, let's say, let's say I do S trace against an HTTPD process. Well, you can, if you dump the IO buffers, you can tell that's a, um, a get request for a certain resource or something, right, by digging into the S trace. But the D trace toolkit has a, has a script that will, maintain a list of your most common requests um, in real time, you know, without you having to go through the, air, the access log and, and compute something on that. Um, so lots of cool things here worth looking at if you're on Solaris. And I know Dtrace is on more platforms than that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, here's something. I don't know if it's been around a while, but I just saw it announced um, last week. It's called Sysdig. Is for Linux. Um, looks kind of cool. Gives you a higher level view of things other than, well, let me look at all the system calls. Let me look at all the file descriptors, you know. You know, instead of having to take all this low level information, make sense of it, it, um, it gives you some much more powerful commands. And we'll go over an example of that in a sec. But, you know, here's a case with, um, here's one of the dtrace toolkit um, proc systime dash in httpd. So for all the processes uh, from, you know, httpd, show me the um, time sent in different syscalls in increasing order of time, right? So I, I filtered out a bunch of um, stuff that wasn't used much. And we, in this particular case, right, the event ports implementation that was the um, most time was spent there among all the syscalls, which I guess is just because we're waiting there all the time. Uh, shouldn't be a surprise, but 
And this is just a completely normal situation. Um, you know, if you had some right extreme performance problem, you know, after deploying a new application, you know, it might be that something kind of out of the ordinary would be down here towards the end of the list. You know, the profile had changed of, of what the server had done at a low level, and that might be a hint at, um, at what you need to look at. Uh, here's just a simple sysdig. Uh, actually, I want to say more thing, one more thing about DTrace Toolkit. This is on FreeBSD 10, and this is all pre-installed, like that proc systime command. Now, unfortunately, there are like this many commands in the DTrace Toolkit, and this many are pre-installed on FreeBSD 10 because those are the only ones that work perfectly or something like that. So there are actually variations in the DTrace capabilities or how much of DTrace has been debugged for one platform or another. It's kind of unfortunate, but you know, if you learn, if you get familiar with DTrace, you can, you can use it elsewhere. It's just that somebody's canned scripts might expose a system difference. Um, nothing too interesting here. Um, I.O., what files is um, HTTP D doing the most I.O. with? And uh, I had requested, a, I probably hit refresh in my browser. I don't, I don't know how I did this. But I was surprised to find out that I had still, I still had a mod log forensic log enabled. I had forgotten about that. So, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to look at what, what's going on in the server using different tools, and maybe you'll be surprised. Okay, um, DTrace one liners. Uh, I think these are like seven years old or more. Uh, so Brendan Gregg is a guy who works on uh, performance analysis at Joint, and he he wrote the DTrace toolkit. Um, and people talk about these one-liners a lot. And uh, one day, actually maybe two days, <laughs> a year to a year or so ago, I went through and I said, hey, you know, every time I try to do something on Mac or I try to do it on a free BSD, it's just not quite right. I'm going to start with the one-liners and see what happens if I do them just the way they say on all the plat on these three platforms, right? So uh, green, this is stuff that works just the way it's supposed to, and, and orange are things that kind of work, but they're not quite right. You know, for example, a case where um, on Solaris, I had a nicely formatted command name and, and command line arguments for process on OS X Lion. I was getting like a buffer dump you know, running the same command. And um, ah, all green, this is good. I guess these are um, files that are opened while we load, while I ran some commands. Uh, what else? Some cases there's a, um, I don't know what this one is, but there's some cases where uh, people are using different kind of providers for DTrace. Uh, Solaris has some that have never been implemented on another platform. So, um, you know, those, uh, like the sysinfo provider, there's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, looks like I'm looking at, um, I want to sort by frequency of reading, reading a character or something, reading bytes. I'm not sure exactly what that is. And, and it relies on a sysinfo provider that FreeBSD 9 and OSX line didn't have. So this is kind of just to say beware. Beware of what's, um, what's going on. I'm sorry, beware that when somebody says, okay, here's a formula for DTrace to find something, it might not work on another platform. And some of these are pretty cool. Um, like Checking the I.O. sizes, I think that's what this does. Um, how big are the I.O. requests, you know, writing or, or how much data was read. Now, um, I don't have that published anymore, and probably won't. I had asked Brendan if I could, if I could put it somewhere, and I never heard back, and I didn't, I didn't nag him until he responded, because I might need him to do something important for me someday. So, so we'll see, but that's just a general idea of 
portability of D-Trace. Um, GDB, PStack if you're on Solaris. Personally, I don't, I don't use it on Linux because uh, I think RHEL 5 or something when I was trying to use it, it, it sucked out the wazoo, so maybe you have better, better luck. Um, I mean, instructions for GDB are pretty common. We don't need to go over all those, but um, there's some pieces of information that are useful uh, when, you know, let's say if you had a crash in HTTPD and, and you want to report a problem, what kind of doc do you gather? Well, usually people go, you know, GDB and HTTPD core file, where, and post that. And what they've done is they've captured the, um, some thread that sleeps for almost the whole life of the process, doing absolutely nothing. And if you really want to be helpful, uh, you want to, hey, let's list all the shared libraries that are loaded. And I guess on Linux, that also displays the addresses where they're loaded. Let's see the state. Let's get a quick snapshot of what all the threads are doing. And um, for each thread, get me the full backtrace, which if you have a debug, debuggable build, you know, you'll see parameters in to functions and um, local variables even. And also for all the threads, let's display the, the, the instructions around the current program counter. Uh, sometimes that can be cool because usually all your threads are sleeping in some syscall. And there are, I forget what the instruction is, if it's stuck on a return instruction or something. They're kind of, all these instruction counters are or, or the, usually the same or most, for most threads. And then, oh, there'll be some guy that's in a move instruction. <laughs> uh, pretty common way to die. Uh, you know, if you have a seg fault, right, it's, it's probably moving data around using bad pointers. So it's, it's, kinda, it's another piece of information. Um, and this, you know, these commands on Solaris will get you most of the same information, although not the, not the current instruction. Let's see where we are. 231. Um, if you're really, like if you have a debug build of HTTPD and you're, you're debugging your module or, or just trying to understand something in the server, uh, we have this GDB init file in the source distribution. So source that thing and now um, anywhere you're with a request rec handy, you can dump, you know, like dump table will dump all the depending on what table you dump, right, you can see all the input uh, request header fields or the ones you're getting ready to send to the client. Also, doing stuff in filter context, uh, dump brigade, B or BB or whatever the variable is called, and you'll see what data is being processed by the filter on that call. So that's, that's pretty cool. It's worth um, looking at that. Let's see, can we do this really? Uh-oh, what's it called? I forgot what, what I was supposed to look at, but let's say we looked at this one. You did, you did all the GDB crap, and you got a, a file that looks like this, and boy, you got thread 27, and it's all, all this GORP, and um, thread 26 is like that, and oh, it's in PHP stuff too. Um, you keep going, okay. Well, what's pthread con weight? I don't know. Well, so if you're not a, if you are a developer, you know, you're accustomed to looking at these, you know, just kind of subconsciously, you just ignore like three quarter, at least three quarters of the stuff in, um, in GDB output, right? Because you can immediately say, oh, that's not doing anything interesting. But um, if you're not a, if you don't know much about the internal structure of the server or things like that, it can get pretty hairy. You know, how would you recognize normal behavior? Uh, sometimes even figuring out where the crash occurred is hard. And uh, like I say, developers kind of subconsciously, you know, jump to the interesting things. And users sometimes end up not giving us the right information because, 
you know, it's all Greek, right? So I actually wrote a, um, a tool that's actually available to use, maybe it'll work, um, to try to address this problem, right? So, so I have like this web application called, I call it the HTTPD Process Explorer, right? And uh, you press on the upload button or drag and drop a like GDB output onto there. And um, you can, it'll, it'll format the information and, and annotate it and try to figure out what's actually happening. Right, so immediately we see, well, we've got this process and it's grouped it into, well, there's one thread that's like that, and there's one thread that's like that, six that are like this, and so forth. And uh, let's see what these are. Let's see, I've got a site minder thread that's idle. Um, I've got a thread that's a, it's an NPM child worker thread reading the client request. Um, now, it doesn't go into the details of exactly what SSL request, uh, what SSL operation it's doing, but, you know, it's just kind of a general description of what that thread's doing. Um, here's a case, it has no, I've got three thread, uh, six threads with this backtrace, but I really have no idea what they're doing, and it's probably in the middle of a handshake or something. You know, it's setting up the SSL, so no annotation for that, too bad. We got another site minor thread, and um, you know here's another one, right? So immediately, you start to be able to to grasp what's going on. I guess there was no crash in this one, and then you can expand this and get more get more information. See the exact backtrace. I know that's hard to read. Um, sorry. Let's we'll see if there's another one that's a little more interesting. I should do one with a crash, but I don't know. It's just another, another set of output from GDB or PStack and then annotations. So um, it might be fun to play with that. Uh, now, it's, no, I don't think that ever six months goes by without me having to fix some parsing problem for C++ code. Uh, I don't, I don't have any C++ modules myself, and uh, you know there are a lot of third-party modules written in C++, and, and they look different, and the parsing blows up. But you know there's a place where it says send me an email if you have one that won't parse. So th this some tools like that can be useful if you're not, if you're trying to make sense of what the server's doing, and you're not a HTTPD developer yet. Let's see where we are, 237. Um, so building the code differently, uh, a lot of things you can just do with your stock HTTPD build, right? The way you built it doesn't affect, um, you know, what kind of logging you can enable. But uh, getting back good backtraces and such may depend on, you know, level of optimization, um, there may be some platform specific issues to look at. There are also some things you can do when you build it to, to play with other cool things that we'll, we'll talk about. So like um, mod backtrace that we'll talk about soon. We already talked about it a little bit. You know, like on, on ARM, like on my Raspberry Pi boards, you know, I have to build a server with this unwind table option or the glibc backtrace function won't be able to do anything useful. Um, you, may, you may notice that in, in a highly optimized build, some of the stack frames or some of the functions don't even show up as separate stack frames because the code's in line. So you might, you might want to disable that. And, and it really depends on a lot of factors. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's worth thinking, okay, here's my... Here's my production build of HTTPD. Let me build a, a let me do a similar build, but with um, debugging enabled and lower optimization. So you can always have another server with the same functionality in it. Uh, and then play with GDB and see if you can get meaningful data. So hook tracing, um, here's a new feature in 2.4. We don't have a module in the server that exploits it, 
but there's a way for a module, module code to run when we start calling all the type checkers or calling all the handlers and it can run different code right when we call into a particular module. Um, it can call implement code to run when the module comes back and so you can save a lot of useful stuff at that point and you have to enable this module at compile time. I mean you can download the slide if you're interested download the slides and it it talks about the exact mechanism but um, I have an example module for that um, mod hook AR I guess AR for active request right and you can it has a way where you could log the um, whatever caused the request to fail. I bet Eric's seen something like this before. But see, this is with real open source code. You know, it says in this case, this is probably not the most interesting example ever, but in this case, it was a 404 error, and we were in the handler hook and had called in the mod CGID at the point when a, a bad result was returned. Or it can even display, hey, where were we in the case of a crash? Right, so in this case, uh, by the way, if you ever see this guy, don't put him in your server. Uh, we had called into the handler hook of that module, and that's where we seg faulted. So it's kind of cute, and uh, it's an example, you know, if you want to implement um, some kind of diagnostics into another module you have, or you want to experiment with that, um, you know, you can get the source code of a sample module there, and uh, extend it and make it really cool. Let's see. These trace probes, okay. There's a lot of code in, in 2.4 and trunk for dtrace, but it doesn't work. It's not complete, etc. cetera. Um, if anybody ever gets him interested in, a, you know, user, what is it, user provider or whatever they call it in dtrace land that HTTPD could implement, um, there's a starting point. And one thing I was curious about, I hadn't looked at mod dtrace in a long time. There is a module that, um, let's see, I, I, Prefetch Technologies, that's the name of this guy's website and I guess company, and company, Maddie somebody, I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, but he wrote mod dtrace a long time ago and I just, you know, that might be useful to try with 2.4. Now exception hooks. Okay, exception hooks are capability that's been in the server for a while. If you have, maybe you have a module, really interesting module, and, and sometimes your module crashes or some other modules in the server crash, and you want to run a little bit of recovery code uh, from the signal handler, right, you can implement an exception hook in your module. Um, unfortunately, you have to, HTTPD has to be built differently to make that kind of code work, but I think um, Fedora, Fedora's HTTPD and Debian's HTTPD, at least recent versions, are built with that, right? So, so you can use your hook in that module in those cases. You know, if you're using somebody else's build, you probably want to see if that, if that configure option's been enabled. Uh, Mod what killed us uses that. And uh, with the latest versions, uh, most of what you get with mod what killed us at the time of a crash is is uh, the request headers on input and the the request line and information about the client connection okay and if you have if you also have mod backtrace loaded mod what killed us will call mod backtrace and it'll spit out its stuff to the log too okay um, so we're about, we're about time to uh, talk about, to handle any other questions. So let's, let's just jump forward to that. Uh, any questions about this? Any, any kind of debug topics you want to raise and see if anybody has hints? Guess not. Um, Use the one where it doesn't occur. Yeah. <laughs> but you want to find out the reason. Too, right? Well, let's see. Uh, like totally different, totally different versions, or just you know. Two two and two four. Two two and two four. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. I don't know. You have to. You have to 
start backing up to, you know, the first point when, I mean, you're really going to have to debug it probably and see what, what's the first point where it becomes visible. Like I know the problem you're talking about, right? And, I'm just talking, I'm trying to make it a general Yeah. A general, a general solution is to use a version that doesn't crash or something and then hope somebody else fixes it. But, right. but yeah, you have to start honing in on the symptom. Wait, what is a symptom? Well, it, it seg faults maybe. And um, then you have to, if it's not immediately clear that the code where it seg faults has a problem, then maybe it's in a data structure that was modified much earlier in processing and it kind of set up a time bomb. Well, what is wrong with that data structure? What is wrong about the shape of it or the pointers that are in there? Why don't I just start looking, looking at an earlier hook or back up way in processing and look at the same data structure? Do I have the same problem in there already? If so, then keep going back, else move forward a little bit and, and see. You know, try to see where the, where the memory problem or where this time bomb was introduced. That's, I think that's the way you approach that. Any other, any other question? Let's see what else is here. D trace stuff. Um, the guys that used to work at Sun and, and went to join it, they all have pretty cool stuff about about debugging problems. And uh, you know, the good side of Solaris was always that it had a lot of tools available to you. And and some of these guys, particularly Brian Cantrell, worked on some of these tools. And uh, he, there are a lot of talks there, and they're not all about bitching about Larry Ellison, although some of his are, and that's funny too, but um, cool stuff. I guess that's it. Um, anything else? Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.